sharing good news of great joy to all people. Elation Church. Welcome to Elation Church. We're excited that you're joining in with us this week for worship. And if you're watching from across Four Corners, Florida, we invite you to come out and join us every Sunday morning in the gymnasium of Citrus Ridge Academy. Citrus Ridge Academy is just off of Highway 27 on Sand Mine Road, and we look forward to seeing you there. Each week when we begin our online service, we start out by singing a song together. So join in with us as we bless the Lord. Let's pray together. God, we bless you. We honor you. We worship you today. We thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. And I pray now as we come together to look into your word, that you would speak to our hearts, cause your truth to come alive on the inside of us. Help us to be doers of your word, not just hearers only. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to week number three in our series that I've entitled, Putting on the Armor of God. I've known about the armor of God for a very long time, probably over 50 years, but it hasn't been until recently that I've discovered how to put it on. Maybe you're familiar with the armor of God, but do you know how to actually put it on and where the battlefield takes place? 
We're going to be talking about all of that again this week. The armor of God is found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. Let's listen to the word of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, we're engaged in a spiritual warfare on a daily basis. And you know what? Nobody is in a battle. Nobody's in a war without having an objective. There's, there's always objectives in warfare. Throughout history, some of the battles that we're familiar with, some of the wars that we're familiar with, have been over land, have been over resources, have been over freedom, have been over control, have been over hate. There are always objectives in warfare. And Jesus described to us the, the battle that we're engaged in on a regular basis because there's a thief that's coming against us. And in John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. And then Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. So our enemy is trying to steal from us. He's trying to kill us. He's trying to destroy us. And Jesus is wanting to give us life and life to the fullest till it overflows abundant life. So it comes down to this. In this spiritual warfare that we're engaged in, our enemy's objectives are to steal the blessings and promises that God has made available to us to keep us from taking hold of all the promises from the word and the blessings of God. And his other objective is this, is to hinder the advancement of the kingdom of God. He wants to stop us from sharing this good news in this great kingdom with other people around us. So that puts our objectives to be the absolute opposite of what our enemy's objectives are. Our objectives are to enjoy the victorious, abundant, and blessed life that Jesus has provided for us. And our objective is to advance the kingdom of God. So, that's what we're talking about. In this warfare that we're engaged in, we have to put on the armor of God if we are going to be victorious, if we are going to take hold of the blessings and promises, and if we are going to advance the kingdom of God, we have to put on the armor of God. Now, we started out in week one talking about stand with the belt of truth. And part of the truth that we looked at from the Word of God is that our enemy, Satan, wants us to believe his lies and not experience the abundant and blessed life Jesus has provided for us. You see, we have to understand that truth that we are indeed in spiritual warfare. And the belt of truth, we need to know this, that God's Word is truth. That is the standard for us to discover and know what is true. God's word is truth. One of the lies that the enemy tries to give us is that God doesn't love us and God can't forgive us and those kind of things. So part of the belt of truth is that we stand knowing that God loves us. He loves us. 
And part of the belt of truth is knowing that we are more than conquerors. We don't just barely win in this battle. When we position ourselves on God's side, we are more than conquerors. We don't win in the bottom of the ninth with two outs and two strikes. No, no. It's, it's like if we're playing baseball, it's like the 10 run rule. I mean, they call the game because we are so far ahead. We are more than conquerors in every situation. And that is truth from God's word. I'm more than a conqueror in every situation. Last week, we talked about standing with the breastplate of righteousness. And we said we got to put this on every day by knowing that we are right with God because of Jesus' death on the cross. That made us righteous. We've been acquitted of all the charges. We've been declared innocent by the judge of eternity. And we are accepted by God. That's how we put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now today we're going to look at the sandals of the gospel of peace. Ephesians 6 verses 14 and 15, stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, if we're putting on sandals of the gospel of peace, are, are we looking for some mysteric, mis, <laughs> mystical ancient sandals that are hidden in a tunnel under the Temple Mount in Jerusalem? I mean, are we looking for physical sandals that God has somehow empowered? No. We have to remember that Paul is writing this letter to the Ephesian believers and the believers in Ephesus in He's probably looking because he's in jail. He's bound between some Roman guards and they're wearing this armor. And the Holy Spirit begins to speak to Paul, letting him connect those pieces of armor with the spiritual battle that we're engaged in. So we're not looking for physical sandals that have gospel of peace written on them. No. See, the spiritual battle that we are engaged in it's not a physical battle. It takes place in our minds. That's where the battlefield is. It's in our minds, and it happens on a daily basis. So how do we put on some kind of spiritual armor that will prepare us for a battle that takes place in our minds? I believe we put on each piece of this armor with our words with our profession, with our confession. Because when we put our words in line with what God says, it positions us on God's side. Jeremiah 1.12, God said, I watch over my word to perform it. So one of the main things that our words do and our confession does it it's a threefold purpose, but one of the main ones is it positions us on God's side. Because if we're saying what God has said and, <laughs> and what's in God's word, then we're on God's side, and that means he's on our side. But if our words are just repeating the, the thoughts and the suggestions and the feelings and and all that thing that the enemy brings us is against God's word. If our words line up with that, with those negative feelings and suggestions and thoughts and temptations, you know what? We're positioning ourselves on the side of defeat, on the side of our enemy. And we're surrendering to our enemy in this spiritual warfare. So the first thing our confession does is it positions us on God's side. The next thing it does is it establishes our hearts and minds. When we hear God's truth coming out of our mouth with our ears, it begins to establish this truth. As a matter of fact, when the Bible says, stand therefore with these pieces of armor, it's the same thing as being established in truth, established in righteousness. 
established in the gospel of peace. So our words help establish our hearts and minds with God's truth, and our words do something else. Our words announce our victory over the enemy because we know that God is watching over his word to perform it. And guess what? When we start positioning ourselves on God's side, the enemy knows that he's already defeated and that we are going to be victorious over his schemes. Remember when we read just a minute ago that we won't fall to the wiles of the devil, his schemes, his plan, his lies. We won't fall to that. So our words announce our victory. So let's take a look at what we're looking at today. It says, stand having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, stand, it comes from the Greek word, histemi, and it does mean stand. It means to abide, which means to take up residence in something. It means to establish, like I've already said. So we stand in, we abide in, and we are established in this gospel of peace. We're standing in, standing in. So what we've been looking at is we're abiding in, we're standing in, we're being established in truth, we're doing that in righteousness, and we're doing that in the gospel of peace. We're standing in them, we're abiding in them, we're established in them. Now, peace is very important. Peace is very important. How many times do you find yourself in a situation where you want to have peace because it seems like everything's going crazy around you in your mind, on the outside, on the inside, and we need peace, right? Well, the good news is this. One of God's names is Yahweh Shalom because God's so big, he's got to have a lot of names. Well, I mean, you know, we're the same because like I'm Dean and I'm Jeffrey Dean and I'm the son of my parents and I'm the father. So there's all these names that describe who I am and the relationship that I'm in with other people where one of God's names is this, Yahweh Shalom. See, his name is I am peace. So our, our words need to get it straight that, you know what? God wants us to have his peace. The Bible says in Acts that the kingdom of God is actually about righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So God wants us to understand his righteousness, his gift righteousness that we talked about last week. He also wants us to take hold of his peace. And he also wants us to have joy in the Holy Spirit. So he has given us and promised us, and it's even who he is. He, Jesus even said this. I'll go ahead and throw this out there because it's coming to my mind right now. Jesus said, my peace I give to you, my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. See, the peace of God surpasses understanding. The world can only give us peace when everything's going our way and everything's calm. But the peace of God goes beyond that. We can have peace in the middle of a storm. We can have peace in the valley, as the songwriter wrote. We can, we can have peace when it seems like everything is falling apart because God is our peace. He is the great I am peace. And Jesus gave us all the peace we need. So we take hold of it. And part of the way we take hold of it is by speaking the truth that God has says. I have the peace of God. My God is Yahweh Shalom. He is the great I am peace. Jesus gave me peace. And it's different than what the world identifies as peace because it surpasses all understanding and it guards my heart and it guards my mind. And you know what? When we begin to speak the peace truth of Scripture, we will begin to experience the peace of God. So we stand in the peace of God. We also stand in peace with God. Because Jesus died on the cross for you and for me. You know what? Our sin had us separated 
from a holy God. But because of that gift of righteousness and putting on the breastplate of righteousness that we talked about last week, now we are at peace with a holy God because we are righteous. We've received His righteousness. So we have the peace of God and we have peace with God because of what He has done. Now, that word stand, it, it means stand, it means abide, it means to be established, but it also means two other things. It also means to continue and to bring. To continue and bring. So it not only means standing in, it means standing for. Standing for. Now, when it says stand, having shod your feet with the gospel of peace, we not only stand in the peace of God and stand in the peace with God, we stand for the peace of God and peace with God. So to continue means this. We continue when it doesn't stop, right? Because if you stop, then you're not continuing. So when we, when we shot our feet with the gospel, the good news of peace, that means that we're, it's not going to stop with us. The gospel of peace is not, okay, I receive it and thank you, God, and then I got it, my family has it, and then that's all. That's, that's all I'm concerned with. No, it can't stop with us. For us to stand in it, it means that we're continuing. It's not stopping with us. And to stand means to bring, bring to others this gospel of peace, this good news. So remember what our objectives are. The first one is to experience the abundant, blessed life that Jesus has provided for us. Hey, that's all about receiving this good news of God, this good news of peace with God, and this good news of the peace of God, and we take hold of it. That's us experiencing the gospel of peace. But our objective is also to advance the kingdom of God. See, here's what we've got to understand. If the gospel of peace stops with me, then the kingdom of God will not be advanced through me. Let, me. let me put this with you instead of me, because it's easy for you to sit there and say, yeah, that's right, Dean. Well, what about this? If the gospel of peace stops with you, the kingdom of God will not be advanced through you. And part of our object objective is to advance the kingdom of God. See, but we have an enemy. Who, who wants us to just let this gospel of peace just stop with us. He doesn't want it to be advanced through us. He doesn't want us to continue. He, don't, he doesn't want us to stand for it. And you know what he does in this battlefield that takes place in our minds? He wants to paralyze us with fear. He, he doesn't want us to advance the kingdom of God and stand for the gospel of peace. No, he wants to paralyze us with fear. And one of the main fears that he wants to paralyze us with is, is the fear of rejection. It's like, well, if I speak up for God and if I speak up for the gospel of peace and I want to allow it to go through me and continue through me and I want to stand for that, then we say, well, this... These suggestions and these thoughts from the enemy will say, well, what if you start talking to them about God and the good news, and then all of a sudden they reject you? What if they say no? I mean, nobody likes to be rejected, right? So the enemy wants to paralyze us. Maybe, maybe they won't want to listen. Maybe they'll tell me that they don't want to talk to me anymore. Maybe they'll tell me, they don't want to be my friend. Maybe they'll hide from then on every time I try to talk to them. Because, and, and all these thoughts go through our minds. You know why? It's, there's a spiritual battle taking place. 
And if the enemy can keep you silent and keep me silent, then the gospel of peace is not continuing through us. And the kingdom of God is not being advanced through us. So he wins. 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 8 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, a lot of us memorize that verse and we stop there, but let, let me read the next verse. Let me, let me read it together with verse 8 because we need to keep it in context, right? It says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So never be ashamed to tell others about our Lord. See, he's telling us this. Don't be paralyzed with fear. Don't be overcome with timidity because the Holy Spirit, God, has given us power and love and self-discipline and we should never be ashamed to tell other people about this gospel of peace, about our Lord. The enemy wants to paralyze us with fear. And the enemy also wants to suggest to you and to me that sharing the gospel of peace is, is really not your responsibility. I mean, after all, that's what the preacher gets paid for. That's what God called the preacher to do. And let me tell you something. It's not just the preacher's responsibility to advance the kingdom of God. As a matter of fact, the preacher is supposed to encourage the body and equip the body and, and by the Holy Spirit through teaching, he, he's supposed to equip and empower with the Holy Spirit, the body of Christ to do the work of the ministry. Like I said last Sunday in our live service, this is just the huddle. The church service is the huddle. That's not the game. The game begins after we break the huddle and we go, all go out to advance the kingdom of God and to take hold of the blessings and promises of God in our everyday lives. So it's not just my responsibility. I mean, it is my responsibility, but it's also your responsibility to stand for the gospel of peace. Romans 10 verses 14 and 15 says this, but how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? So answer that question. People have to hear the gospel from someone. It, it doesn't, there's, there's no nine foot tall angels walking around telling people about this gospel of peace. That's our job. That's your job. That's my job. We are ambassadors for Christ in this earth. So the Bible goes on to say in verse 15, it says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring the gospel, who bring this good news. So the enemy wants to give you suggestions and thoughts like to paralyze you with fear, to tell you that sharing this gospel of peace is not your responsibility. And then he also says, well, you'll probably mess it up. You can't share the gospel. You, you'll get somebody all messed up. You don't even know what to say. Listen, I've got a question. Can you tell somebody how good a restaurant is? Can, can you tell somebody how good a movie was that you saw or a TV show or, or a stage show that you saw? Could you, could you tell somebody how good that is? Could you tell somebody how good a car is if somebody was asking? Of course we can. We always do that. We always tell people about our favorite food, our favorite restaurant, our favorite show, our favorite cars. We talk about that all the time. Here's my question. Why do we find it too difficult to tell somebody how good God is? If we can talk about a restaurant, if we can talk about food, if we can talk about a show, if we can talk about a car, how much more 
Should we be able to tell somebody about how good God is and how good God has been to me? After all, listen, gospel, the word gospel means is good news. We have good news. The gospel of peace that God wants to give everyone a peace that's greater than the peace that the world can give them. He wants to give them peace with him where their sin has separated them from a holy God. And God wants, God wants to establish a peaceful relationship and to forgive the sin. And you know what? That's good news. It's good news. And we have good news to tell. Acts 1.8 says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Each week in our online service, we have people watching from all over the world. So I can't put in individual names of, of where you live and all that, but I can do it right here in Four Corners. So we receive power. When we come into a relationship with Jesus, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, comes and moves, takes up residence on the inside of us. The Bible says that we become the temple of the Holy Spirit. And it says this, He empowers us, in the verse I just read, He empowers us to be a witness, to tell people about this gospel of peace. And we can put it this way. And since our church meeting is physically in Davenport, Florida, we could say in Davenport, in Four Corners, in the greater Orlando area, in Florida, across the Southeast, across the United States, and around the world to the ends of the earth. But only you can put in where you are and spread that circle out. But listen, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit who lives on the inside of us, if we're in Christ, if Jesus is Lord, He's going to empower us to be a witness. He's going to empower us to share, to stand in this gospel of peace, to stand for this gospel of peace. So it doesn't stop with us, but it continues through us as we advance the kingdom of God in this world. So, as we conclude our message today, the Bible tells us that we need to stand in and stand for the gospel of peace. And every day, we need to put on these sandals of the gospel of peace with our words. We need to proclaim every day, I have the peace of God, it guards my heart and my mind, and it's greater than the peace of the world. I have peace with God because I have been forgiven, and I have received the righteousness that comes from being in Christ Jesus. So I have the peace of God, and I have peace with God. And we need to go ahead and say, I will not be paralyzed by fear. Fear of rejection, fear of abandoning. I will not be paralyzed by fear because I have good news to share. And God, the Holy Spirit, empowers me and gives me the words to say right when I need them. And that's a promise from God's Word. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for today. I thank you for your truth. God, help us to put on these sandals of the gospel of peace every day. God, thank you for giving us your peace. Thank you for making it possible so that we could have peace with you. And God, thank you that we are your messengers and you empower us to give our personal testimonies about your goodness in our lives as we advance your kingdom in this earth. Because what you've done for us, you want to do for everyone that we come in contact with. 
Help us to represent you and your kingdom well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining with us this week here at Elation Church, and thanks for being a part of our Elation family. If today's message was an encouragement to you, would you consider sharing it with all of your social media friends? I mean, all you have to do is hit that share button right under the video. In doing that, you'll be coming alongside us in our mission of bringing good news of great joy to all people. We'll see you right back here next week at Elation Church. This online worship experience was brought to you by the friends and partners of Elation Church. 